Thank you, everyone. Um, you all hear me okay? So, I have a little game to play because uh, I'm not originally from the US. I live in New York now and I have done for about three and a half years. I've also traveled all over the world with ThoughtWorks. Um, and so, my accent is a little bit messed up. Um, and so, whoever at the end can guess where I'm actually from, as in where I grew up, gets my Harry Bow because I'm going on holiday soon and I can't eat these. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about continuous delivery at scale. Um, this will be a lot less about tools and about some of the really hard problems that happens when you try and apply continuous delivery in the enterprise. Has anyone tried that? OK, so this is for you. This is a therapy session for you and for me. Um, <laughs> so as I said, uh, I work at ThoughtWorks. Um, I've been at ThoughtWorks about seven years. I joined as a developer before that, working in London in startups and media and kind of just bouncing around all over the place. And I've been at ThoughtWorks for seven years, which is kind of crazy, but it's consulting. So you're always bouncing around. So I guess there's a trait there. Um, but I like, I spend a lot of my time in, as the role of, of head of technology, um, talking to kind of senior client executives, like VPs of engineering, VPs of infrastructure, CIOs, CTOs, and all these people that are like, Ah, how do we get this to work? <laughs> I don't know how to make this work. Um, and so I'm going to give you a nice example story. So you work in a big retail bank. Anyone work in a big retail bank? A few of you. OK, this might, this might be a familiar story. Um, and let's say in this big retail bank, your team is the innovation team. And that's cool and it's awesome because you can do stuff. Um, and your innovation team has decided to come up with a conversational interface so people can, you know, make payments and ask their balance of Alexa or Google Home. Um, and the idea is, is that this will improve the customer experience for millennials out there that, you know, no longer want to type or touch anything. They just want to shout at Alexa, which is what I do a lot at home. It's like, Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. Um, she gets sworn at a lot as well. Uh, <laughs> and she records that, by the way. Um, if you say her name, she records what you say. So anyway, so they want to improve the customer experience for these people. Um, they also want to increase revenue by getting um, more customers from the other banks, uh, who are also millennials, who also want to shout at Alexa to make payments. Um, and so, because you're in the innovation lab, and you don't have to connect to all of the back-end services or any of the existing infrastructure, you can move pretty quickly. Um, and you can test drive your code, and you can have lots and lots of automated unit, unit tests. You can do all of the things that the books tells you, tells you to do. Um, you would have some end-to-end -end tests, maybe too many because it was kind of cool writing them for a conversational UI. Um, but essentially, you're writing your tests in the test pyramid, and your team is really small, so it's easy for you to do CI, you've just got a small team of developers and, and a QA, and you've decided to pick AWS because, you know, it's just a test app. Um, and so some of the developers have some build skills, so you can basically get up and running pretty quickly. And you've incorporated some feature toggles and some ability to do A-B testing so that you can kind of test out the interface on your user group. You're also delivering continuously, obviously, because we're at a continuous delivery conference. Um, and so you've, you've set up some monitoring, you've automated your infrastructure, you know, everything's pretty awesome and you're using all the latest tried and tested tools. I just put a smattering on here, but you get the idea. There's lots. And you're doing exactly what it says on the tin, what the book told you to do, because you can. And it's awesome. And if some consultant like me comes along, and uh, I could certify you, not joking, I don't certify people. Um, but I'm sure somebody out there is probably certifying Teams as continuous delivery ready. Um, but the point is, is that the app looks quite good and you're able to deploy new features to it all the time. Um, and so you're going to show it off to your boss. And he loves it and he thinks it's awesome and he thinks it's really exciting. And not only does he want us to actually really build this app and therefore integrate with all the real services, he also thinks, wow, this I really like the way this team's working. I would like all of my teams to, to work like this. And even if that executive is spouting things like 2 speed IT, don't even get me started, um, what you're looking at is spreading out this way of working to like tens or hundreds of teams. And that in and of itself is kind of hard, but you also got all of this stuff. This is just like, a corner of an enterprise diagram I stole from one of our clients, names removed. 
Um, and there's mainframes in here, because this, uh, this big bank has been going for like 30, 40 years, maybe longer actually, maybe before technology. But they've been going a while. But what's even worse than that is that they have systems and then they have rewrites of systems and then they have rewrites of those systems and rewrites of those systems and they're all there. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, we love rewriting stuff, but we just keep all the old stuff around. Anyway, so what's your plan? Obviously, the first thing you do is you need to call me and be like, what do I do? Um, <laughs> no, but really, like, you can't bring in a consultancy for all of this every time, and you have to figure out how to do this yourself eventually. You have to take the training wheels off. So how do you scale this new cool methodology, which is not that new or that cool anymore? Um, how will your awesome new Alexa app integrate with the horrible backend services? How will it deploy on the real on-prem infrastructure, not that AWS stuff that we're not allowed to use? Well, luckily I've done this a couple of times. I also have the scars. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk you through some of my experiences of what people do and what maybe they should do instead. This, the first one, is this. <laughs> Step one. Create DevOps team. Does that sound familiar to anyone? OK, good. I'm guessing the laughter was your oh, yes. Um, OK, so I think Dan said this morning like he was on a build team of eight, te eight people, and it was eight people too many. Um, well, everywhere I go, they have a DevOps team, and it's like, I don't know, hundreds of DevOps teams too many. Um, <laughs> but it is a very common first solution, right? You're in the enterprise. Someone needs to figure out how we're going to automate some infrastructure or take on some of these new patterns. And initially, it makes sense because in the enterprise, you've got, you've got a QA team, you've got a development team, you've got you know, security teams, you've got an ops team. So like, obviously, we're going to need a team to do this. And what better word to call them than DevOps? Um, <laughs> and then you need to think about, well, who's going to be in this team? that I've just created. Well, you know the devs can't do it because, first of all, they're writing new features um, from you know, backlogs and roadmaps and business plans that were created three years ago. Um, <laughs> and you, it's really, really hard to hire for it. You try to hire like somebody in a DevOps role, it's like, it's like trying to hire a unicorn. Um, <laughs> seriously. You know why? because it's two different jobs. <laughs> um, so the best that you can do is think, well, OK, what's, which team has got the most appropriate skills for this role? And they have the right background for it. So I know, let's get the ops team to do it, and we'll rename them the DevOps team. Any of that happened to anybody? Yes. OK, cool, we're all on the same page. So we also changed some of their responsibilities. So not, not only are they responsible for all the things that they did when they were ops, they now have to automate all the infrastructure and deployment and create some kind of mega platform that suits everybody's needs. This is not a good idea. Just that spoiler alert. It's really just a rebranding exercise. Um, the problem is, is that there was never really enough ops to go around. Right, so could we just for a show of hands, how many ops in the room? OK, so that, how many developers? Right, that's actually better ratios than most enterprises that I've seen. I reckon there's about like 10 to 20% of the room. I don't see 10 to 20% of an enterprise being ops people. So you've still got this huge constraint on these people's time, as well as all the stuff that they were doing before. So there was never enough people to go around, and the ops time, ops time, sorry, the ops people were busy dealing with uptime and SLAs and recovery and all of that fun stuff that they have to deal with. And they created all those controls and gates and pain points for developers, not because they hate us, although I think some of them do, um, but I don't blame them. <laughs> but they can't handle all that change, and they definitely can't handle your crappy software. So where does all this magical capacity come from if you rebrand them as DevOps? It doesn't. It's just the same team with the same skills that they had before. So why didn't they do it before if it's the same team with the same skills? Well, maybe they didn't have the you know, blessing from on high that you must do this or, or told that that needed to happen. But even if they do, 
and you're lucky enough to have like maybe a couple of people on the DevOps team that can code, that want to, that are excited about this stuff, that couldn't wait to get their hands on Puppet anyway, and they're you know, gonna go off and start writing all these infrastructure scripts for you, and automating everything. The best that they're gonna do, given that they're the ops team, <laughs> is automate today's world. They're not gonna set up, not gonna set your organization up for the future. They're gonna automate what's happening now, and what you commonly see is a couple of ops people get rebranded as DevOps and they go off for a couple of years and write some scripts and they'll be back with your mega platform soon. TBD. Um, <laughs> how many people have, been, have rewritten like legacy puppet scripts at, at this point in their life? Come on, there's a few of you. I've seen many of those. <laughs> that guy looks like he's, gonna, he's just pissing himself down there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, they become legacy too, right? Because you've got this one, one or two people who are like, oh, cool, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'm, I want to do it. May have been doing it at the weekend or whatever, and they go off and they try and write an entire new platform. You have to go back to the original constraint, right? So the original constraint is we don't have enough people, we don't have the tools in the right hands. So you have to solve for the real problem, and not just automating today's problems, but also sorting out or put, making yourself the ability to move faster in the future. So this actually gets solved at scale in enterprises where I've seen it done well by creating a self-service platform and automating away all of the non-feature-based activities. And I don't think anyone really disagrees with that in principle, but I haven't talked about any of the caveats yet. But you have to figure out like, what's in the platform, what's out the platform, who's going to use it. The delivery teams need some level of autonomy, but also the organization, because it's a large enterprise, needs some consistency for governance. You want to remove friction and you need to meet governance needs. When the developers were in what I call full rebellion mode, autonomous teams, um, <laughs> the early world of like cross-functional developers and they do everything themselves and everyone was starting around going, you build it, you run it. And this dev rebellion caused a lot of issues for a lot of organizations. Thankfully, most of the financial organizations I worked in never actually let them do that. They were like, no, <laughs> that's obviously never going to happen. But there are many organizations that did go down that route when they weren't ready for it. And when you've got teams that are able to just pick any tool that they want, and I think Dan had some slides earlier of like, you know, being downstream is poop, essentially. But they've picked all their own tools and all their own database technologies and all their own cloud providers and all their own everything. Not only does it require the delivery teams to learn a ton of new skills, but you often find that those teams spend more time fixing infra stuff over here than actually building features. And most enterprises, most businesses don't really like that because they hired them to put things in the pans of the public and make cash for them, not to fiddle around with things. Not that it's not valuable to have a functioning pipeline, it is. But not everyone was hired to build that. Now, as I said, autonomy generally freaks out large enterprises, large command and control places. And a lot of those controls are in place because of past issues. Now, I was working at a very large media organization a couple of years ago, helping them with continuous delivery, and they weren't highly, highly regulated industry, which means they could let the teams be a bit autonomous. They also had, so they had teams being able to pick any tools they want, and they'd kind of taken on that build it, you run it mentality. But they also had a DevOps team as well. And the DevOps team were building a mega platform that was to be released soon. And they weren't getting anywhere fast, and it was a complete nightmare for them. And they were like, what do we do? What, what are we doing wrong? And I said, well, first of all, you've got the we build it right, but you haven't got the we run it, because you've passed it off to somebody else. You've still got a DevOps team functioning in the old way and being that beholder of poop, but it's much bigger and there's lots and lots of it. And I said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, you literally you have to choose, right? You're either gonna, you're gonna let the development teams learn all of this stuff that requires to support software, or you build a platform, but not how you're doing it right now. 
And like most enterprises, they went down the, we should probably build some kind of platform because it turns out developers don't like dealing with infra, infra issues. Not many of them anyway. They would like to, a lot of things just work for them. And they'd like to work on the features and the real problem solving and the cool tools in their space, not all the infra stuff. So the solution is to build a user-centric platform. You have some ops people who help build the platform and developers, dev and ops together. That was the whole idea, it was the whole culture piece. The people that build the platform should be both of them. So you need to find some developers, find some ops people to actually start building the platform. But also, you have to determine, sorry, what are the requirements of the platform? And what can the developers choose to do themselves? And what needs to go into the platform? And you have to do it iteratively. Do not try and scale out the entire platform first before anyone's actually used the platform. So this is the one user of the platform. And these are some of their requirements. There are other groups that have requirements in the enterprise, like security and compliance and the data team and ops. They all are users of the platform and you have to take a user-centric approach to building them. This is more of a cultural change than a tool picking platform building change. And I guess that's why it's so hard. Because it's not the DevOps team that's bad. If the team is made up of Dev and Ops and they're building a user-centric platform, that's actually good, but they do need to work differently. And as I said, don't try and scale it before it's actually been used. I always tout the mantra of use before reuse. That team that was off building the mega platform for like a year or two, they had like one team using it and that team was not super valuable to the business or the things that they were doing weren't because they wanted to do something low risk. But doing something low risk probably means that you're not getting in all the requirements of the things that you will need to be on the platform. But it's a trade-off. Okay. So, <laughs> you kind of, your organization goes, okay, right, I think we figured this out. We're gonna bring the developers and ops together. We're gonna build this user-centric platform around the requirements that we need, and we're gonna do it iteratively. We're gonna do it agile, sweet. What's the next rabbit hole that people fall into? Tools. Thank you. Um, people love picking tools. I love picking tools. I love playing with tools. That's, you know, we're problem solvers by nature as developers, but, and new tools are like, ooh, I wonder what problems this will solve. And off we go down the rabbit hole, which is fun, but probably not what you should be spending your time doing. Because the tool, in fact, is going to be the least of your worries. <coughs> Remember all those like rewrites and mainframes and, oh yeah, I know, I'm sorry. It's this boring old chess note. It's the people and the process and the technology. I've done literally like, well, not literally, but like I've done bajillions of continuous delivery assessments in many different types of organizers and many different types of enterprises. And it always boils down to these things. And when you do like a value stream map, it often looks something like this. This is a real one, I scrubbed out all the, all the names. And you'll see there's like, there's all kind of waste over here. And actually like the ability to release is not, not their biggest problem. Huh, interesting. But this building and testing, not great. Analysis, not great. Planning, ooh, terrible. Okay. So your tools won't fix all of those inefficiencies. And let's say that because most of the room is in the technology section, you don't have to tackle this beast. That's somebody else's problem. And we hand it over to Jez and, and those guys that wrote the Lean Enterprise book and say, fix that section. Goodbye, come back later. But even if you <laughs> only have to fix these sections down the further end, here's some things that I guarantee will hurt you fire and flames. Um, organizational silos. 
cause all kinds of incorrect optimizations. You get bureaucracy that masquerades as governance. Um, you get politics and fiefdoms and empire building and it all gets a bit Game of Thronesy sometimes. Um, I literally had a client one day where someone said the red wedding has occurred. <laughs> <laughs> that means lots of people got fired. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, you know, these structures and these hierarchies and these things in this organization, they existed for a reason. They were fixing all the problems that they used to have for one reason or another. And they were also using a management structure and a way of working that was like best of breed at the time. Like they have reasons for all of these things. I, I, I feel like sometimes my job is like an investigator. I'm like digging, find out like, how did this ever get like this? Like, where did we begin? Um, and if you get right down to the crux of it, there's usually like a good reason for a lot of this stuff. Um, but <laughs> it doesn't help you today. There's also communication, which is hugely painful. So when you go down the road of continuous delivery, you, you should just hire somebody into the role of communicator. Um, because whatever people like mishear or misread or they don't hear properly, they make up their own story in their head and then they tell everyone about it. And before you know it, people are like telling you all kinds of random stuff about what's happening and who's getting fired and what changes and you're like, what? Like we're just building a pipeline, what? Um, <laughs> and you get like a big them and us mentality, like, oh, that special team and that innovation team and that'll never work here. That's different. Everything is always different. Uh, and then you've got capability, like training and educating people in the new ways of working, never mind the new technologies, is a bit of a hurdle to cross. But let's pick the, the big hard ones. I like to refer to this as the frozen middle. So thankfully, I was in Iceland and I took a picture of a mountain with snow in the middle. So at the top, you've got some executive dude going, cool, like we want this everywhere. And then you've got all these people at the bottom who were like, trying to get stuff done, and then you've got this section in the middle of the organization that's like, no, you shall not pass. Um, <laughs> and all that's caused mostly by fear. Um, so people feel unstable in their roles, right? All these middle managers have got where they've got today through the status quo, through the way that the organization is currently structured, and the current optimizations and measures that they have, they've achieved and therefore they've continued to succeed. Hopefully, that's the reason. Um, but this new world is terrifying for them. We're talking about autonomy and people making decisions. It's like, if they're making decisions, what are we doing? Um, and sometimes, this is actually one of the reasons you get the DevOps rebranding, because the ops people are like, what, developers are going to do everything now? Like, no, I need a job. It's just occasionally that happens. I have heard that before. Not in those words, that was my like, interpretation of what they said. See what I said about communication? I, I hear what I, I want to hear, and so does everyone else. Um, anyway, the real problem is, is to really change that in order to get everyone working towards the same goal, you have to change the way that people are measured. So if people are still being measured by the number of bugs they, get, they catch, they're not going to be motivated to build any quality into the system because then they will catch less bugs. <laughs> and if people are motivated or measured by on time and on budget, so they deliver on time and on budget, but they cause all kinds of performance issues elsewhere, well, that's not my problem, ops can deal with that. I was on time and on budget. So yes, you need new measures. And everyone needs to be aligned around these measures. So this is like everyone right from the top all the way down. Determine what are you building and why are you building it? Well, it's more the why, actually. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it for growth or engagement or revenue? And be careful not to like create these little KPIs or OKs, OKRs or SMART goals or whatever on a team basis. Because that's a little bit dangerous as well, because you can always end up with optimizations. You've got to look at the whole value stream of the thing that you're trying to achieve, all the different teams that are involved in it, because even if they're cross-functional, there still might be many different teams. Someone's got to ma manage and make sure the measures are all aligned. The other thing is, is not only do these measures need to be 
really clear, everyone needs to be aligned, they need to be transparent, everyone can see them, they're all over the organization. You need a quick feed mechanism on the measures. You need accountability. You can't just like measure stuff and be like, did you hit that measure? No. Oh, well, never mind. Like, there needs to be, you know, not saying come down with them, like, you didn't hit your measure, but there has to be accountability within the teams for that measure. And that's sometimes where, you know, these managers with their old skills can actually play a role. The other thing is, is that over half the measures actually have to come from the bottom up. Because the measures have to be decided throughout the organization by everybody in order to get alignment by everybody. This is no small feat. Um, but we know that top-down dictation is not effective for employee engagement. And we also know from the Puppet Labs survey a few years ago that the engagement of your employees is kind of critical success factor. But tackling that frozen middle, you will have to do. Um, and you can't ignore it. I've had many executives be like, well, can't we just like shield the team from it for now? It's risky, very risky. It's only a matter of time before you have to deal with it. So getting those managers engaged early is better because they will try and disrupt otherwise. Other bottlenecks. Things masquerading as governance. Okay, so admittedly, if you live in a world of like say healthcare or government or finance or you hold any PII data, you have some level of security and compliance requirements. That is a given. However, there are lots of great tools and practices that you can use to not have to send that to somebody across the building and wait for them to tell you whether you passed. Um, so when I was working with a client like a year or two ago, a large financial client, and we were like building up and setting up the teams and the teams were all working very agilely and you know, it was all CD until it went to the security team. And then like three days passed and they came back and was like, you need to fix this, 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 this. I was like, hmm, this sounds really familiar. I feel we've been there here before. It feels like this is a test. <laughs> so much like QA, if you kind of build some of these requirements in early, you might pass the test earlier. Or you might ha not have to have such a big test. Or you might not need an actual person to sit there and test it. I'm not saying that's the case with, with all of those things. And you certainly, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to have a security and a compliance expert and some, you know, and, and, and in every team because that doesn't scale. But where it does scale is when you build these things into the platform and treat these people like a customer. But it doesn't hurt to engage them early. I know a couple of times when I've been into organizations and I said, oh, can I uh, speak to the security team? People are like, why do you want to talk to the security team? I think that's changed now, but at least at first it was like, why do you want to talk to those guys? And the security people were like so excited and engaged that people were asking their opinion. Normally they're just the guys giving you bad news. So you can build some of this in early, and I'm not saying that you're going to turn all of your developers and all of your ops people and everybody into security experts or compliance experts. Nobody can be an expert at everything. They should certainly be aware of some of these constraints, but getting some education would actually help them earlier, right? So for example, in the analysis and architectural sessions at the start when you're thinking up this beautiful conversational UI or whatever it may be, you can get them to come in and help you with things like threat modeling. People can learn some of this stuff. Which leads me to capability. In the new world of continuous delivery in the enterprise, people will need to learn new skills, even if you build a self-service platform for them. And that's because this is the world we live in. So back when I was writing code a lot, this was my world, and I considered myself a generalist. I could do lots and lots of things. Of course, today, who thinks they're a generalist here? Hats off to you, seriously. That is just, what? And underneath all of that, like, I don't know, 50 million JavaScript frameworks, new platforms being released every day. Like, I don't know, I don't know if I would dare to say that I was a generalist. Um, but if you are, wow, because it's getting worse. And this is the context of which we are deploying software now. This is the world. 
And at ThoughtWorks, for years, we've been like generalist, generalist, generalist. Because generally, if you have generalists on your team, they can do more things and they can deliver faster. And that's great. Right up until the point where <laughs> explosion happened. And we know that we can't like, be generalist security experts and we can't be generalist compliance people in general. We need the experts to advise us and help us build the right tools. But I think it's hard to even be a generalist mobile developer. Like, are you Android or iOS? Those are very two different environments. There's probably more coming. So I know Dan talked earlier about, you know, a few years ago we hired ops specialists into ThoughtWorks. Well, now we have mobile specialists and security specialists and different types of data engineering specialists and we have to. And that's not to say that they're everywhere and we've kind of cordoned off different groups of people because that's dangerous. But we're starting to spread this knowledge and create training and figure out how to get people to adopt these new technologies or move from maybe just being a straight up Java developer to an iOS developer. And this is actually gonna get worse because obviously we've got conversational interfaces, which I'm excited about, and maybe AR and VR will finally live past the hype and we'll suddenly have to develop in 3D. Can't wait for that. <laughs> um, so how do people solve this stuff at scale? You do have to pick tools. You have to take away some of the autonomy. Now, that's not to say that there's none, right? Because the people that build, you know, the platform pieces for, say, iOS or Android, you should probably get, you know, those experts involved and be the user to say we need these tools and I think we should pick these tools. But in general, if you need to basically train up 400 of your web developers in iOS, are you going to put them on a two-week training course and then come back and say, so which tool would you like to use? They're going to say, like, I don't know, the one that I learned to train on, I don't know. It's, it's hard. And when you're in the enterprise, they want answers to these questions. So you have to pick some tools. Yes, there has to be a way of changing. <laughs> it's not like pick a tool, make the platform, never touch it again. The platform has to continually evolve, just like the software. And, you know, people poo-poo architectural review boards, but there are levels at which there are certain people that need to be involved in making decisions and creating that as lightweight as possible is definitely the goal. But at the same time, there are certain things that certain people need to be involved in to make a decision. The enterprise is not like, yeah, just do whatever you like. It hurts. So you have to leverage your SMEs, create guidelines and how, to, how to's, how to's, how to's and pre-built pipelines and Make it as easy as possible so that, in theory, the developers can focus on solving the problem regardless of which platform it's in, if you need them to, and take all the tools out of the way, which we would hate, by the way. <laughs> there has to still be some choices in there. But that depends on the enterprise, depends on the organization, where the flexibility is. But getting rid of all the tools, I mean, Neil Ford always says, meta work is more interesting than work. Like, we love playing with all that stuff. And we still can, and we still should. Um, and we've seen a lot of enterprises adopt the idea of, like, you've probably seen the ThoughtWorks tech radar, but, like, letting them build their own radar. And the point of which is to identify, like, what is in their adoptering, what is the hit the ground running, and which things are they starting to trial and assess and starting to determine like, okay, we've used this on a few new projects, let's make it part of the platform. We're having success with this, we think it's better. Angular soaks, whatever. Um, <laughs> sorry, I heard it got better. Um, <laughs> the point is, is things change, right? Like, Angular like, was the forerunner in that world and everyone was excited about it and now everybody hates it and everybody's moving to React and next year it'll be something else. So you need a platform that can somehow evolve to these kinds of things. Ooh, shit, five minutes. Sorry. Okay, I need to be, I need to be quick. Okay, so I'll tell you what we'll go through really, really quickly is tackling legacy architecture. So I actually have entire talks on this stuff. Um, so I'm happy to share with them later. But essentially, at some point, you've got to tackle all the legacy code. So Easiest option is, if you don't need to change all of the underlying systems, you can create some kind of gateway and you can pop all your new UI interfaces on the top, which is great. Sweet. 
except for if you need to make any changes to the underlying system. Now, it turns out often you do, and the underlying system or the underlying services might not be that performant, might not work very well in the different types of client interfaces or UI that you're working with. So you need to start breaking things up and creating new modules. And this is about the time, if you're wondering, that you're allowed to start talking about microservices. If you talk about them before then, I'm going to get really grumpy. Because um, <laughs> people love starting with that. They're like, we're going to do continuous delivery, we're going to do microservices, and we're going to use these tools. And I'm like, wrong problem, wrong problem. Um, because this is the point where you need to determine which architecture or which, what's the size of the service or the component that actually supports what we're trying to build. And then you might consider using microservices. But what you, oh, one thing also is don't stop like halfway through. The world of rewrite over rewrite over rewrite is basically like forever being stuck here. It's actually worse before it gets better. But what you might realize is eventually you just need to rebuild the whole thing. And now you can pick some new tools, and it's very exciting. Because you're living in this world. And I could just say the end, but that's not the end. Because how do you stop yourself from getting into this mess all over again? Now, <laughs> I think, let me, how do I phrase this? It used to be in the world of business and in the world of the retail banks of old that it was all about the competitive advantage. Getting to market first mattered. And so when you set up businesses and you set up software, it kind of was for life. But that's not the way the world currently works. It's all about transient advantage and being able to adapt and evolve to the new world. And this is what your business wants. So as the IT development ops team, you have to figure out how to do this. But one thing not to do is to be like the tube. What's your least favorite line on the tube? Central. Central. Why is central the worst? Because it's hot and too busy. Why is it so hot and so busy? Well, the tube had the competitive advantage. It was the first underground rail network to be built. And it was awesome because building it underground, you didn't have to get agreement from property owners. You build the tube, everyone's happy. But that pride from being the first soon disintegrated because they did not foresee the effect of heat retention, how many more passengers they would be, and the subsequent need for air conditioning. And because it's so small down there in those little tubes that they built, you can't retrofit air conditioning. So newer systems learnt from, sub from London's mistake. And for example, I live in New York, and I get to experience the subway, which is lovely and air-conditioned, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> every day. <laughs> But everyone has to suffer from this inflexible design. You can get where I'm going with this, right? Uh, <laughs> this is uh, Jaron Lanier, who wrote the book You Are Not a Gadget, one of the founders of like, the internet world and stuff. He's a pretty cool, kind of crazy dude. Lock-in coupling is an absolute tyrant in our lives. And in software, it's probably worse than it is in the railroads because everything's shifting and changing all the time and all these new tools are coming in all the time and so you have to be really careful about the decisions that you make which is why you have things like microservices which is really all just about being able to keep things small and rewritable and evolutionary architecture and the idea of like when do you make what decisions it all really comes down to what are you going to couple to and what is the risk of doing that because all of these patterns are just basically tomorrow's anti-pattern regardless there is no silver bullet. Woo woo, boo boo. Um, and the last quote from uh, Yaron Lanier is, software development is a constant adventure in humiliation and embarrassment. Just like the tube. Okay, I have to go. <laughs> oh, it, nearly. One second, can I finish? Okay, I'm gonna do it really quick. Okay, I won't talk about QA, that's a bad idea. You know about Conway's law, blah, 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 blah. Um, the last thing I'll say is, what you have to remember is why you're doing this. If it's so painful, why bother? It's all about value. It's not about delivering, it's about value. And so it's all about 
you want to move quickly so that you can get value quicker, so that you can have transient advantage. This is basically why clients come to us and why they talk to me and why I talk about all of these things. So when you're introducing governance, you've got to determine what your value measures are, whether it be growth, revenue, or satisfaction. And then you have to govern for value over predictability. You're going to have to do all of this hard stuff and boring stuff. But the point is, is all of the innovation that your organization comes up with, the conversational UI, yada, 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 all that fun stuff, it's just, it's nothing without being able to execute. And all that continuous delivery is, and all of these practices and do's and don'ts are, are really just about having the ability to execute. Because that's, that's what continuous delivery is at scale. Sorry, I talked too long. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.